On the outside off stump. That's it. That's a half volley through mid arm for four. The bat goes in the air. The England players come out to applaud what really has got to be a moment here of cricket history. This is a man, of course, who needs no introduction at all, so I'm not going to give him one. Here he is. Jeffrey. you're our special guest in the world's best cricket club, our modestly titled club. Very welcome. It is, and it's lovely to see you. And where are you? You're in your kitchen in Boston uh, Bar, I guess, are you? In our lounge. In our lounge. We set up here. Yeah, we're fine. We're fine. Rachel had a second injection. I had mine... Uh, about two weeks ago, so touch wood, we've done as best we can. Is there, is there an injection for sort of, you know, muting your voice a bit, you know, <laughs> cutting your sentences down, maybe? <laughs> no, that's difficult. When it comes to cricket, I love it, and I'm quite happy to talk about it. Well, we love, we love listening to you talk about it as well, and we're, we're missing you, actually, although I suppose, you know, there hasn't been much cricket in England so far uh, to, to talk about this year. But it's coming up, and I know you're, you're you're a big fan of the IPL. So, what do you reckon to the Rajasthan Royals so far? <laughs> They've made a cock up, haven't they? <laughs> and one, one of their their main guys has got a broken finger, is finished, and one of them's gone home. <laughs> so the two main guys are not playing. <laughs> yeah, it shows it's... them and unlucky. Simon, you've been doing um, some IPL games. You did the Delhi game, didn't you? Yeah, I did the Delhi game at the week weekend. <laughs> Um, lots of England players involved in that. Um, mixed mixed fortunes. Good game today as well, wasn't it? A tight game anyway. And uh, RCB have never won the IPL. Two out of two so far. Everyone sort of wrote them off. Uh, and so um, actually, it, it's... Uh, did you see Coley smash his chair? Yeah. Today? I mean, one of the nice things about the IPL is the sort of emotion it throws up, doesn't it? It's it's all compacted into sort of three hours, all the emotions of, get, of the game. So Coley gets out, smashes a chair nearly breaks his bat and then you know an hour later he takes a great catch in the deep and they won the game and he's punishing the air in elation so you know anyway Boyx um you, you didn't play in the IPL but I, I think you uh, you would have fancied it wouldn't you I think every lad has to fancy it uh, girl as well if you're invited go play I mean take a couple of empty suitcases and they'll fill it for you I mean <laughs> th there's never been a, a cricket uh, game in the history of of, of of our sport where there's that much money around and I've always believed you you can't expect youngsters to turn that down it's a chance of a lifetime uh, nobody's going to offer you money like that in any other form of cricket and I, I always felt from the beginning even though I'm a test match cricketer I love that best of all I feel uh, T20 is uh, excitement test cricket is an examination Totally different. But we're supposed to have fun at cricket. That's what it's about. If people go and have fun playing it, they have fun watching it. Hell, that's what it's supposed to be about. I was always for it. But I do understand the difference and so forth. And you can't ask kids to turn that down. It's totally unfair. Anybody who says, oh, you've got to stay, play for England, you've got to do this. I say, whoa, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Would you do it? Uh, and, you know, when you retire at 35, 36 or so, um, I don't see everybody rushing out to give you an easy job or anything. You're, you're on your own. So these kids have a right to go and earn, use their talents, make the best of it, get as much money as they can. Nothing wrong with that. How, how would you have played it, Jeffrey? How would you have played um, 2020 cricket, IPL cricket? Would you completely change the way you play and just, I don't know, go to the nets and just practice slogging or whacking it or whatever? How, how would you have done it? Yes, well... <laughs> What you've got to remember is a good question, but the kids today who play it well and have played it, they've played it all their life from being 9, 10, 12. So they, they've, they, they've practised it in the nets. When I practised in my generation before me, there was no T20. There wasn't even one-day cricket. 
And we played on uncovered pitches where the ball seemed, turned, jumped sometimes, sometimes it was a good pitch. And you were taught technique to stay in, to combat all these different uh, variations of the pitch. So we're all, we all play to the years that we grew up, to the situation, the circumstances. If I'd have grown up like them, or Bradburn, or Hutton, or whatever, you'd have played to what you need to. But you, you, what first cricket I played was T20. It was 20 over cricket when I was 10. 1951, I think if you check, was Festival of Britain year. After the war, which finished in 45, the government decided they wanted to encourage a sort of uplifting spirit of the country. We still had rationing. We still had ration books for sweets, beef, fish. And they wanted to give everybody a lift. And they had all these things going on. And one of them was a 2020, 20 overs competition between primary schools. And I thought it was brilliant. I played in that two years when I was 10 and 11. And it got me interested in cricket. The teachers took us out twice a week, practiced with us, taught us things. We, what, we got to the semi-final one year and got knocked. We got to the final and lost the final. And there were prizes. There were Blenhutton bats and things if you did well. And I won one. Well, I missed out on one batting, but I got one for an all-rounder. And, you know, I, I got six for 10 and 45 not out, and I got a Len Hutton bat. 45 <laughs> not out in 20 overs? No, I will had to knock off 50-odd. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, we bowled them out, you see. I got six for 10. And then I got the all-rounder. I thought I'd won the bowling spot. I used to bowl fast medium. I got seven for nine. And everybody thought, my teachers thought, oh, you'll win it. That's brilliant. And there was a lad from Cudworth where Michael Parkinson grew up called Nick Horn, I think his name was. He got seven for eight and he got the bat. And he reminded me on Test Match Special when I was working with Jonathan one day a few years ago, he rang them up. He let them know that he was listening. Nick Horn from Cudworth. Brilliant. It, and it was brilliant. 20 over cricket is brilliant for kids. And the best thing about it, what they should do, is allow and make it a, a rule. Every kid has to bowl two overs. The weak keeper of mind is involved, isn't he? Every ball. Every other boy. So you can't have a couple of lads who are so talented hogging it. You want kids to enjoy it. And you make them retire when they get 25. And so they can't hug all the batting. Yeah, and yeah. it's brilliant. You want to get them involved. That's what I do. Mm. What do you think of outs then, Jeffrey? Have you heard about this in the in the hundred? <clears throat> Wickets have gone now. It's going to be outs. Oh, it's marketing men have gone mad, haven't they? They've taken <laughs> over the game. Businessmen and marketing men, marketing men and PR men and gimmicks. That's all they're interested in. Money. They, they don't. They don't have the soul for cricket. I know they like cricket. I accept that. They're all in it, businessmen, they like me. But they've been brought up for a balance sheet. What's the profit at the end? Are we in the black? That's all they're interested in. They don't have a soul and a feel for it like players who've played for years. And if you look at our game, and it's been the same for a number of years now, the chief executives, the chairman, you ought to do that. How many of them have played first-class cricket? I bet you wouldn't find three or four. So they haven't got the soul for it. How many on committees have played first class cricket? They're all businessmen. I know they mean well and they love it, but it's not quite the same. You know? Mm. Yeah, it's that's true. Same. I mean, we on the MCC committee, actually, we try, we're always trying to get more ex players on and you know, slowly happening. But I should think, I'm thinking about it just quickly, chairman of uh, the, the counties, I can't think of anybody who's played mm. uh, first class cricket. I mean, that, David Leatherdale was chief executive of Worcester for a while, wasn't he? And he mm. played for Worcester. But I can't think of too many others, actually. Um, it, it's around. sad because you need a balance. Of course, you, you, you need a game that makes uh, a profit, breaks even. You don't want to be in the red. That's not good for anything. For business, institution, cricket, being in the red is not. So you need some nows from the people who understand money. But also, <sighs> cricket's not just a business. It's a way of life. It's something we enjoy. Yes, it has to be a business in terms of make a success of it. We want to be in the black and survive for the next generation. But it, it's gone now. It's gone and it's in the marketing, PR people and all these. It's had it, I'm afraid. It'll be more and more 20 overs. Then there'll be a 10 over cricket. We'll all be dead, but they'll come along, you know, in a few years to come. Well, yeah, listen, well said. Well, well said. I'll give you a round of applause for that. 
good, good, good point. Um, just just while we a little interlude to say thank you to talking about money. Um, this uh, club is raising money for the Professional Cricketers Trust. So thank you to everybody who's been such a loyal member over the last few months. And welcome to you new people who've joined just for tonight. Hope you'll join the club and uh, be regular attenders every week. Uh, we've raised something like four grand now for the, the charity over the last few few weeks, and we're aiming for 10. So we're getting getting on well. And obviously, uh, your presence tonight, Jeffrey, is really helping that because we've had some extra joinees tonight. So welcome to all of you. Um, Thank one, you. You're not paying me, you know. Just no, tell I'm not them paying. That. Certainly not. <laughs> bloody right. You don't need any bloody money. Look at all those ornaments behind mm. you there. Get sell some of those off if you need some money. Um, <laughs> you got a house as big as Yorkshire, Jeffrey. I've been he's there. Just, he's just had a York. He's just had an auction of all, all his memorabilia, anyway, haven't you? And you did really well out of that, actually. There's some some great items on that. What what raised the most? My hundredth hundred bat. Your hundredth hundred bat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's just brilliant. a one-off iconic, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it must be quite. It must have been quite sad to part yeah. with. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to part with any of them but uh, when I lived at Wakefield and then I got cancer and we left because our feng shui master said it had lost its energy and I was still trying to recover I went to live in Jersey so we boxed everything up and it went and I never saw him in Jersey and then there was that seven or eight years and then we came here to Boston Spa and the boxes were up in rooms you know two floors up I never saw him for 15 years all stuff there and I asked my daughter, you know, nobody lives forever. What are you going to do? What do you want to do with them? Well, I can't put them all up, Daddy. I'd need a huge room. I asked my wife if she'd put them up in a couple of three rooms here and, and charge in the summer and do cream teas and sandwiches. But she said, no, she's not interested in that. <laughs> she didn't fancy doing that. I mean, what do you do with them? You, well, you I'll tell you what I do. Look, I put them on my, I put them on my wall. What do you reckon I'll raise for... For the Durham shirt and the Middlesex jumper, what do you think I could get in auction for those? Ten quid. Yeah, I was thinking at, maybe twelve. Look at the <laughs> look at the books at the back here. I mean, they'll they'll raise a fortune, won't they? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, uh, no. He was a good bowler, side man. I always told him he was a very good bowler. He always hit the middle of my bat, didn't you? <laughs> well, I was going to I was going to lead you into that actually because we had that stat up earlier: forty eight thousand four hundred twenty six first class runs. Was it? Something right? like that, yeah. And, and you obviously, I mean, serious point, you obviously loved batting. That's an understatement. I love the game from when I first played it. I still love it today. I watch England in the winter. Um, I, I really need to watch them, but I like watching them because I write for the Telegraph, as you know. I write special articles. And uh, so I do watch. I watch the one dayers as well. I keep abreast. Um, might not watch... Every ball of the one day is there's a lot of similarity in one day cricket with respect. Some can be wonderfully stimulating and entertaining, but sometimes they can be, well, they can fizzle out because one side doesn't bat very well. And then it's pretty easy to knock off the total when they bat. So, yeah, but I keep abreast of it. The test matches I watch all the time. As I say, they're, they're an examination, you know, of character, mental strength, technique. How do you handle situations when they come up? And I, I find that fascinating. I always did to watch how people handle them and how some don't. I know you played on un uncovered pitches, Jeffrey, but yeah. in, in the modern era, were those pitches that England faced in India, so late, later on, not the first test, but later on, were they as tricky as test match batting gets in spinning conditions? I'm not talking about seeming conditions or overcast or anything like that, but in spinning conditions, were they about as difficult as you've seen, I don't know, for... Yeah, they were pretty uh, difficult. I, I, I don't slag off the England team. I, I only criticise them if they play bad cricket. They didn't play bad cricket there. They were outplayed by people who were better at bowling spin and better at playing spin, to be honest. Uh, sometimes then you've got to put your hand up. England are not great at it, especially when I heard people saying in Sri Lanka, you know, they did great. I said, yeah, but Joe Root got 200. <laughs> That's a hell of a lot of runs, isn't it? The rest of them didn't get too many. And I I was looking at it slightly different from all the praise they were getting. One man just getting all the run. Uh, not a recipe for a good team. You, you need a number of people. Um, we used to get turning pitches in county cricket. Let's be honest, we got some good pitches too. 
And some days back on a nice day and lo lovely sunshine, get a hundred. They weren't all bad, but we didn't get green tops. They were wet. Sometimes there were dry turns. What India did, they can make very flat, excellent batting pitches that last five days if they want. Mm -hmm. They saw England coming. And once they lost a, a match, that person, they think, ah, 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 we're going to go to what we think better than them at. And they were right. I played in India and we lost the first test um, on a, yeah, that turned as well. And it seemed as well, it did everything. They were a low scoring game over in three and a half days. But then when they were one up, <laughs> they made flat pitches. So even if we made runs, we couldn't bowl them out. You can, it's up to the groundsmen. Um, so they're, they're not all bad pitches, but they saw England come in. They looked at them, said, we don't think you're that good. We don't think your spinners are that good. We don't think, or at least we think we're better. And we do the same in England. We've had pictures where it seemed and swung all over the place because we've had Anderson and Broad who have been wonderful bowlers, still are to a degree, but they've been at the zenith, what well, very, very fine bowlers and bowl most people out. Actually, um, it was Virat Kohli, I think, who <laughs> said to Ollie Pope during that series, um, after the first test, I think Virat Kohli said to, to Pope at non-striker, or during the first test, right, that's, right, that's yeah. the last flat wicket you're getting. Yeah, yeah, and I think right. Pope read the race. Well, they all read the race yeah. after that. Um, listen, we, we'd love to watch uh, some, some footage of you actually playing on an uncovered pitch in a minute. Just before we do, that's Alex on the screen. Alex, um, just to uh, introduce, introduce you for a minute. Uh, because you've been very helpful, not only in supporting this club from the start and also getting your father-in-law involved, but also you've you've found some sponsorship uh, for this particular event. So tell us about that, Alex. Well, hi. Good evening, everybody. And, and, and Sir Jeff, thank you very much indeed. On behalf of all the members, thank you very much indeed for spending some time with us this evening. We've, whilst this COVID pickle has been going on, it's been lovely these Thursday evenings. I've been... Uh, listening to some of them on catch-up, actually, because work's been quite busy, but they've been a, a, a lovely oasis to, uh, to, to to come and listen to the, the cast list that we've had, and, and obviously we have you tonight, so thank you very much. In, Pleasure. Uh, very much indeed. Uh, yeah, I've just got a, um, a, a couple of things. I, I, I spoke to um, our local greengrocer in, uh, in Twickenham High Street, Paul Cooper, who's been there for 40-odd years or so, and um, he's very kindly, um, hopefully you can see this. I'll just hold it up a little bit. The, 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 the Some rhubarb. It's the rhubarb there, <laughs> Sir Jeffrey. And um, uh, there's a lovely hamper there. That's quite heavy and I don't want to drop it. Uh, we were going to put that up as a quiz question. Um, we were going to put that up as a bit of a quiz question tonight uh, to, to, for, for the members. Um, but um, I've liked this so much, um, Simon. When I see you next, I, I, I live next door to Simon, Simon from time to time. Um, I'll, I'll give you a donation for the trust because uh, I, uh, I think that um, it, rather than sort of try, try and give that away to the members, but absolutely superb. And, uh, and Paul, Paul Cooper in the high streets done a fantastic job there oh, well with done. the sticks of rhubarb, which I have a feeling may come up in later later questions, <laughs> Jeffrey. So, rhubarb uh, we'll is go good for, for you, let me tell you. He's grown around Leeds, <laughs> fields of it. Wait for <laughs> the Leeds. Obviously, one of your one of your trademark uh, yeah. expressions, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, and Nords and the, the two Simons will lead in later. I've um, given up, uh, given away uh, one of my sets of headphones that I sell. They're bone conduction headphones as a, a as the prize tonight. And um, yeah. wherever whoever win whoever wins that, I'll make sure that um, 150 pound worth of headphones. I'll make sure that the uh, aftershocks headphones. Uh, get uh, get sent out there, but uh, most importantly, thank you very much indeed for for coming tonight, and um, and uh, we're really looking forward to listening to you. Great, well said, well said, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, we'll to a question <laughs> later about uh, who's going to win the fruit and who's going to win the headphones. Um, I hope hopefully the fruit, but because Alex is going to actually deliver the fruit to whoever wins it, so hopefully it's someone near London. Jeff Boyks, you missed the opportunity there when he said, uh, I sometimes live next door to him. <laughs> ah. You see? 
And you always always accuse me of living under a park bench or on it for most of the time. <laughs> so this is actually a house that is my girlfriend's house, which is next door to, to Alex. So that's why uh, I sometimes live next door to him, you see. Mm, I see. Mm, I'm not sure I've got hopefully all that. That's, <laughs> hopefully that's permitted. Are um, we going to see Boyks batting on an uncovered we're pitch? We're going to see Boyks batting. So um, we are going to see him bat on an uncovered pitch. Now, this uh, just to, to, to introduce this, so, boy, you can tell us this was 1971 Pakistan test. Give us the background to that Lords before we play it. Uh, 1971 Lords Pakistan test. First test was that? Second test? Second test. Right. I missed the first one. OK. I missed the first one. I was um, getting... good, good pitch, bad pitch, you know, nightmare bowlers to face. No, not really. It seemed, seemed a bit. Look, there's always something to work with at Lords because of that slope. I think it's about 11 feet, isn't it? It's a very unusual. There's, I mean, if you bowl a straight ball, a foot outside of stump on the length, it'll probably hit off stump because they just down the hill. And uh, it's a fascinating place, wonderful place to play, but it, it does cause a um, little difficulty and it does help the bowlers to move it in the other end, move it out, uh, and it affects your balance. Because if you think about it, every pitch there, if it's... 11 feet up there, down there. Every pitch you play on, I think it's about two and a half inches or two and three quarter inches slow. Mm. So actually, at one end, if they're bowling from the pavilion end, you feel you're sat back on your heels a bit because it, the balance is taking you back because of the slope. At the other end, I always felt I was falling over and the tendency to play at balls a little bit wide of off stump that I didn't really want to play at. So you've got to just uh, adjust a little bit and get used to that. But it's a wonderful place to play. But it does give something for the bowlers. Bowlers like bowling there. Look at my graph from the pavilion end. Mm. Oh, he just gets people out for a pastime, doesn't he? Jim, Jimmy's it, pretty good as well, isn't he? Well, yeah, and he he he, he likes both ends. He swings it yeah. either way. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if you're bowling an in-swinger from the <laughs> pavilion end, you don't want to be pitching off stump. Mm. Because by the time it's pitched and running into you, you just clip it down down the slope you want to be outside of stump same thing so it's gonna hit off stump right well look there you are uh getting ready to face uh, before i play it just uh, very close sort of very close feet feet close together there in your stance well i i didn't have a wide stance like some of the people i'm comfortable there look it's i'm at ease mm. it's yeah. comfortable i'm upright i'm not bent over too much the eyes are the most important thing no, we say everybody talks about the head and balance. It's not quite true. It's the eyes that are important. You can keep your head still, but if you close your eyes, it's not much bloody good batting, is it? It's your eyes that matter, to keep them on the same level. And there the eyes are on the same level. If you bend over too much, you've got one eye behold the other and you can't focus as well. It's focusing that's important. And on the balls of the feet, and you're ready to just move. You want to be at ease, comfortable, so that you can move forward, back, and you don't want to be use, moving fast or quickly. You want to be like a dancer, gracefully. Well, moving. I'll tell you what, let's just watch a bit of this, because you, you certainly were very nimble at the creeks, and actually you hit the ball surprisingly hard as well, so just watch a little bit of this. Rainbow in the second test at Lords, but Jeff Boycott scored his eighth test hundred in England's first innings. Here he is now, facing Salim. Oh, Salim Alto. Yeah, I like Sally. He's nice. Play. Not many people in the ground. Uh, Indica played for Surrey. Indica right bowler. Yeah, uh, good bowler. Here he is again. That's through, and it looks like four runs in his fifty. That could be it. It's there. I think it's there. It is indeed. Boycott was 121 not out. He scored 112 in the third test at Headingley, out after batting for 14 hours. England won by 25 runs to take the series 1-0. to nil. So um, that was just a few clips there. Uh, I think that's Zahir, is it? Is that Zahir, Zahir Abbas? Um, the young Zahir. You there? Yeah. Z-man. Um, so, so, I mean, actually, I don't know if it was an uncovered pitch, really, but 
there was certainly some you can see some bits of sawdust just there so it was obviously a little bit damp. there'd been rain yeah there'd been yeah. rain but i mean and look high back lift there look at that right up like the old Bar bran lara almost yeah periscope what they they talk about today uh, is a little bit look there's no point ringing them up we're always talking about people hitting it with power and what have you but look the bats weigh about three pound you know we had bats at two pound four ounces two pound four an ounce four and a half ounces and i know that's what hutton and compton use because when i started playing with flasinger which was down the road from me at wakefield they had bats from Silvers, bradman he played with gradage and and these people and they were they were just the same the matchsticks and that's why people couldn't hit sixes so easily because you were fearful of, hang on, if I time this perfectly, I can get six. But if I just miss hit it a bit and they've put mid off and mid on back, I'm going to get out. These days with three pound bats, they miss hit it for six and if they hit it properly, it goes about 10 to 15 rows back, doesn't it? And it's that's the difference. I'd like to see a game, you know, for fun. I don't mean to embarrass anybody. I'd like to see our players play a match. And everybody has to use about two pound four ounces, two pound four an hour. They'll be amazed at how, how much different it is. They've mm. grown up, you see, with big bats, isn't it? And it's second nature to think like Johnny Best. <laughs> he just thinks, your ball is spinner, I'll just lob him out the ground. Miss it for six, hit it <laughs> up in the stands if I hit it properly. Not so easy to do that if you're thinking, you know, I miss it, I'm going to out. Look, in my first class career, I hit more sixes than Bradman. Yeah. Good fact. Bradman hit six, seven. No, six. Six. He hit six. I got more, more sixes than Len Hutton. He hit seven. Hmm. And the Doyen, where you come from, Middlesex, suppose the artist, the one who played lots of shots, Dennis Compton, the boyhood, the Brill team boy everybody loved, he hit three sixes. You wouldn't believe that, would really? you? Three right. sixes. Wow. And, you know, people just didn't. And when you went to Nets, when you were a young kid growing up, the coaches, if you tried, you know, you've been batting a bit and you played, and then you think you're trying it off spinner over the top. Arthur Mitchell would turn around, keep it on the floor, lad. That's a way of getting out. <laughs> and, and Bradman, if you read books about Bradman, he didn't like to hit it in the air. He said, it's just another way of getting out because the bats were so... And, and that's the difference. It is a big difference. And, and look, we're all, we all turn out as players, the type of players in the era we played in, in the pitches we played on, the type of frickets we play. Mm. That, it, it, we're all just we are yeah we're, we're going to get some members questions in just a moment just just perhaps one more thing on just on back weight did you ever feel that like i mean two pounds four is um, is really it feels really light i mean i i, I play i play club cricket with like two eight two nine and that felt about right two nine felt about right yeah. but i remember one season going down to two seven and it just felt exactly that if you could try and hit this over the top and miss q you're going to get caught mid on mid off so two four is, I mean, it's, it's nothing at all. No, it isn't. I mean, it, I didn't know any other because that was what most people mm -hmm. had. It's what, what, that was the era we played mm -hmm. in. And, and if you go back, I mean, when you think of Gilchrist, the wicketkeeper as Australian batsman scored 106s in Test cricket, was it? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But it's it's just a different game, a different. I, I think it, I mean it is a different game, and I, I'm just going to wait, make one point about it. It is the bats, but the bats give the batsmen confidence, and Ooh. therefore they know they can take on those fielders, and they can really fully commit to those big shots over the fielders on the boundary. So I mean, there was a con a contest recently between Flintoff and Butler, and I know Freddie's retired, but he was still sort of playing a bit of cricket here and there, and they tried six hitting with the same bat. And Butler hit it twice as far. There's something about not, I mean, not only is Butler an absolute artist with, with hitting the ball, you know, incredible timing, but because they, as you say, they've been brought up with that sort of play, they fully commit to those cool. sorts of shots. And therefore the miss hits do carry as well. It's partly the bats, but it's also the approach and the attitude. 
Of course it is. Absolutely right. You need confidence. That's why I always felt good facing you. Oh, very good. Uh, right. Well, listen, I could play uh, some shocking performances by you but as, as a result, but I'm not. Yes, I'm going to celebrate your best ever day on the cricket field, which, of course, was your 100th 100. So let's just play a little bit of that. Yeah. Here we go. That's his first boundary. Typical boy's butt shot. That's a shot he plays so well. Well, that's a lovely shot for four. Now we've got that's half century. He's half the way towards that record of being the first man to hit his 100-100 in a test match. That's a shot. That's a shot. Eight fielders on the offside. Yeah. That shot, it's hooked away. It's in the air, but it's going to be safe. And a good shot, in fact, by Boycott. Jeffrey Boycott just uh, waiting and hoping for a nice half volley outside off stump. a half volley through mid on for four the bat goes in there the England players come out to applaud what really has got to be a moment here of cricket history Jeffrey Boycott 100 hundreds and the place to get it in the middle of a test match against Australia on his home ground at Headingley it is actually an amazing story that to achieve that you know it's can't imagine the pressure you must have been under. And I bet you shed a tear afterwards, didn't you? Um, well, I've been writing about all kinds of things. That was one of the things I've been spending my time because there's nothing to do, is there? You've got to stay in and with this COVID around. And I've been writing quite a bit and trying to put my thoughts and feelings down on paper. And yes, it, it was it was the expectation I come back to test match cricket, missing 30 test matches in the best part of three years. I came back at Trent Ridge. That was enormous pressure and managed to get 180 not out. And we won the test. So I was relieved after that more than anything. Quite a lot of relief because I was under a lot of pressure coming back. Um, and then we went to Edgebaston and played against Warwick in a rain ruin match. I got another 100 there and I wasn't thinking much about it. And, uh, and then it's when I rang Rachel, she said, oh, you've done it now. The press are all on. You're going to get your 100th 100 at Headingley. Oh, my God, no, I don't need any more pressure. I was thinking, God, I got through Trent Bridge. And it, when I got to Headingley, there were the nets the next day. There was sacks of mail from me, letters, telegrams kept coming, cards wishing me well. And all the media was saying that I get me 100. And I'm thinking, hang on, there have been a lot better players than me throughout the history of the game in all the countries of the world and there's only 17 people got a hundred hundreds and I'm supposed to get mine to order a hundred on my home ground in front of my home crowd against Australia and Ashes I'm going wow I mean it's just it's just asking too much I thought this this is ridiculous obviously I'm going to give it the best shot but i I didn't really expect it, and I couldn't sleep the night before. I mean, I was nervous. I was uptight. But I, I, I've never changed my view on nerves. I believe nerves are important in any big occasion for any young, youngster or people at the top of the sport because if you have nerves, it's a natural reaction to your care. It's important to you. And it's about can you channel that nervous energy into a performance? Not try and stop nerves. No, you should have nerves if you really care about it. But can you handle the nerves? Can you channel them and perform? And I didn't sleep. I had four hours sleep only and I was late to nets and oh, I was uptight about it. And um, um, Brian, Mike Brearley walked out with me. He could he take first ball. He got out fourth ball to Thompson for naught. That woke me up pretty quick, I could tell you. <laughs> you know, we're not for naught, not for one rather. And I'm going, whoa, Christ. So, but 
I managed it. And it, it's about, yes, you need a good technique. I had that. But you need mental strength. It's, it's a mental side more than anything. It's certainly emotional, but it was mental. And uh, I did it, but I just one of those things. I don't know. Just was. What, what, what do you reckon? Um, what about the, you talk about good technique. So give us a little critique of these couple of shots here then. Um, There's one here. Well, this will be my signature shot off the back. That's your I, I could shot. play that from a very early age. I could play that from a very early age. And, you know, when I played this match as well, you see, That's off the shot. back foot is easy. I was. What about this one? What about that one there? That's just that? an ease. We call that that just easing it through, not, not flashy, just easy. Mm. You know, just ease it with a little timing and it'll get there. It, listen, if it rushes to the boundary or just tickles over, you still only get four, don't you? This, this is a good shot, isn't it? Because you sort of found the gap between about five cover fielders there. Yeah, and he kept putting them really back good. and back and tempting me. And uh, again, Beautiful it's just placement. timing. If you take it early, you can hit it more extra cover in that gap there. Just take it a little later, it'll go a bit squarer. So I thought I thought this was a good shot, actually. I mean, because this wasn't all that short, I don't think, really. No, I helped it. I helped it a bit. It wasn't a pull, wasn't a hook. I helped it a bit. And luckily, it went a bit in the air, but it, it went to an area where I was And then obviously, to... obviously this was just a celebration of years and years of dedication, really. Well, I was just waited and uh, I picked two areas, extra cover off the front foot or uh, onside. Onside is easy. So he bowled it about off stump. Um, but the length was full and good. So I could work it from outside, get my head over, work it to the onside. Uh, it was a very safe shot. As soon as I hit it, my hand has gone up before Rupees jumped out of the way. I just knew it. Uh, just you get magical moments sometimes, just a few times in your life when everything's working in sync, the rhythm is there, the footwork's there, and you know before you hit the ball that you're going to hit it, you know where you're going to hit it, and it works. Then there are other days out, you can't get 10 runs, you can't get the damn thing off the square. That's sport, and so it should be like that because. Uh, there's probably only been one genius like Bradman who almost every time he batted, he got runs. But most of us, we have good days and bad days. We just hope the good days are more than the bad days. But it, it, it's right that we shouldn't just be successful all the time. Sport is about character. It's about heart. It's about taking the ups and downs. But that was a magical time. Talking about time, yours. It's time for members' questions, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. And who have we got? Richard. We've got Richard. Here. So, uh, Jeff, we can have a few questions now from from our members of the audience, right. loyal loyal servants of this club. And the first one is Richard Shelley, who has got about ninety five copies of Wisdom, haven't you? At least, what? although we can't see them now. Anyway, good Not to see you, Richard. If only. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Uh, evening, Mr. Jeffrey. Great to have you with us. Thanks for your time. Um, I want to sort of paint a little picture, if I may, before I ask my question, take you back to 1977. Uh, a young 10-year-old just getting into cricket, waiting uh, with anticipation to see his hero bat for England at Trent Bridge. Doesn't have to wait long. He runs down the steps, skips onto the wicket to a great roar. It's Derek Randall, the local hero. Um, runs out to the wicket. Uh, and unfortunately, was going back a, a little bit later, uh, having been run out. And I saw a picture the other day of you with almost your head in your hand. So my question is, two questions, really. One, what was going through your mind at that point in time? Uh, and secondly, I think, how did you then get your mindset back to make a great 100? I think shared a stand of over 200 with, with Alan Noss in that match as well, in that innings. Uh, and I think it, I, I like my stats. And um, I think you became only the second batsman in Test history to bat on all five days of a Test match during that game. So That's just correct. Just to get your views on that. See, normally when that happens, most bowlers, right-hand bowlers, are running to the offside, which is the right-hand side as we're looking at the picture, but to the offside, and they can't get back to the onside. He was so athletic; he got over there in no time at all. His agility was unbelievable. Um, 
Derek always says, watch him, he stops because of Thompson going over. He walks him, it stops him, he goes backwards, and then he sets off with no chance. He always said to me afterwards, if I'd have gone straight away fire, he had to got in because he was a very quick runner. I look, it was very nice of him, but I accept the criticism, the blame, my fault. I didn't see Thompson was going to get over to the onside like that because most bowlers just can't do that as a following through with all the effort of bowling. They could, they cannot get across that quick. Um, at that moment, I was 36 years of age that series, past my best. I'm coming back to test cricket. So there's a lot of pressure on me, wanting me to come back and all that. Most people retiring at 36. So I know it's going to be tough. Um, I, I also know that I'm going to get a going over from Pasco and Thompson because they're going to think, hang on, he hasn't played for three years. I wonder if he's still got it. We're going to give him some stuff. And they gave me a lot of short stuff and that. So I knew I was going to have to get through that. There were also some people, uh, particularly reporters, who uh, some of them hoped I failed, which is sad. Fortunately, most people hoped I was a success for England. So there were a lot of things. Uh, and then to get the extra pressure of, running out the local hero, nice lad who I like and get on with very well. Oh, yeah, I just, I just wanted a hole to open up and swallow me. And the, the pressure was just becoming too much, you know. And it was already tough enough. And it would have been easy just to give in, to get out of the limelight into the dressing room where it would be safe and secure. And but something inside me wouldn't let go. It's just the way I was brought up to play. Don't give it away. Don't give in. Again, mental strength, mental strength, being emotional about it. Yes, having a good technique to stay in. And for a while, I couldn't bat. I couldn't play shots. I just could had the ability to have the mental strength to stay in. And it was Naughty coming in that helped me because he talked to me. I'm very close to him as well, but he talked to me. He started playing, I think, his greatest innings for England. He made 135, I think he made. We were 82 for five and losing the match. They got 243, something like that. We 82 for five, we slumped it. And I'm in a mess. I play shots, I'm just struggling. He comes in and plays the innings of his life and it got me going again, got my feet moving, my brain thinking, and we put on 245 or something, and the game was won then. It was, we had to play it out, of course, but it put us from a losing position to a winning position, magical. I think it was his best innings, and that's what helped me. Him talking to me, I'm playing brilliantly. Right, that's right. Good. Thanks very so much, Richard. Good question, Richard. Very good. Uh, what, what, Richard, quickly, what did you think when you were there then? Sorry? Richard, is it, are, you still, are you still there, Richard? You there, Rich? I am, yeah. I, I've just unmuted, sorry. Um, I was actually watching it on telly, but I... Oh, right, yeah. I, I, as I, just growing up, and, you know, <laughs> I said Derek Randall was my hero, but it was just that sheer mental toughness that come through. Mm. And even Do then, you know, back at certain while I was things, in pain, you grew up, and that the... helps you. Richard, while I was in pain and difficulty, stood there thinking, what the hell have I done? Within 10 minutes of him being run out, then it ran, had taken his pads off, his gloves, his box, everything, and he was down on the boundary with his wife and young baby son, and he was tossing him up and down as if nothing had happened. I could see him at Long On, next to the pavilion, just playing with the baby. And I'd just run him out in what must have been a very, very important test match for him on his home ground, home people, probably family watching. And he was there with the wife, tossing the baby. He was a fantastic guy, still is. Was that done to help and support you to try and get the crowd off your back, do you think, or was it just him as a person? No, it's just him. He was like Pinocchio and strings. I loved him. I mean, when we went on to it, <laughs> yeah, he was. When we went to tour in Australia, You'll get British people who were emigrated there. They would invite us for dinner. And it was always him that I'd get to go with me because he was fun. He's got ants in his pants. He could never sit still. He's funny. <laughs> he was amusing. 
And so the dinner were good. They gave us lovely home cooked food instead of hotel food. In fact, they'd even ask us what, what we wanted. And I'd say, oh, steak and kidney pie or something. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, what, what pudding do you want? <laughs> no, just steak. No, no, we get plenty of that. <laughs> and we just order what we want. We just have a lovely evening now. And it would just make you laugh. It made everybody laugh. It's actually, uh, were you, I wonder if you were in the dressing room that day. He, uh, Mike Brearley went around the team in Australia when England was struggling one day. And uh, about the fourth day, and he said, right, I want uh, some ideas from the dressing room, uh, some players, you know, give us some ideas about how we're going to turn this situation around. He went around the team and each one of them sort of gave a, a few words of wisdom. And he came to Derek Randall and Derek Randall said, I think we need to rise like a pheasant. <laughs> so everybody looked at him and said, what? Rise like a pheasant? Don't, don't you mean Phoenix? And he went, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I knew it were a bird beginning with F. <laughs> we played a match a in Pakistan yeah. that 77-78 we played a match in Pakistan and the pitches were dreadful, they were tiresome um, low slow dinking things and before Briers did his out and had to go home in the middle of the afternoon one match he says, Arkel go and live something up a bit, go and get everybody going so he sent him round the outfield and he started doing cartwheels and everything. <laughs> they just loved him. He was like the court jester. Mm. He just made, made people laugh all the time. Mm. That's why I could never understand. I wasn't there. Why, how that Chatfield could run him out, backing up, you know, in, in New Zealand. I, I couldn't understand that. He, he, he was the most lovable lad you could ever meet. I can't, mm. I can't think anybody disliked him. Mm. Even when he, Lily hit him on the head in that mm. the centenary test, he tipped his hat to him, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, brilliant. What a character. And still, still is a character, actually. Um, right, we've got Rob here now, Rob Whitehouse. Hi, Rob. Um, Hello, great to hi, have guys. you on. Um, thank you for, for attending and all that and supporting. Um, you, where are you? Where are you based? Um, I'm in Hastings. Okay. Oh. Oh, so on the nice. south coast. Yeah, mm, nice, nice one. No, no, no first class ground there, sadly anymore. But no, I still, still some good club grounds. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's there's quite a few club grounds around, and uh, mm. you know, just down the road. You a Sussex? Know, are you a Sussex supporter? No, I'm a Worcester supporter. For me, see, oh. I was I was born in Worcester, so um, I go to go with my granddad up to see uh, Worcester play three, mm. four times a year when when we can. He's ninety four now, so it's Nice. No, okay. it doesn't win. Great. So my, yeah, your question, go on. My question to you, Sir Jeffrey. Good evening. Thank you for evening. the question. So you've played with a host of players past and you've seen all the players in England at the moment. What would be your all-time England 11 and why? Oh, you haven't got long enough time for me to answer why. <laughs> um, I'll give you a bit then. Um, Simon, I'll have to cut it. Look, it is difficult, but we all have fun picking our best county side, our best England side, etc. So it's fun. What I tried to do, and I wrote a book about it a few years ago, and I found it fascinating and did all the history and everything, is we all tend, we human beings, we tend to what we see in the present day, what we've seen, and television gets us every match around the world. They're the best players ever because we saw them, and it gets into our head as such. So the people of the past, we, then, we don't tend to give as much credence to them because we didn't see them. And most people, you know, don't read a lot about the history of the game. And I thought the only way to judge a player is how good he was in the era he played against the other people in that era. Not against the people today, like Jimmy Anderson playing 160 test matches. I mean, he's a wonderful ball, but he's bound to get more wickets than Jon Snow, isn't he? Fred Truman, Brian Statham, Harold Larwood. You just play more. Cookie's got more runs than anybody. He's played 150 test matches. There was a time when they were looking at it. WG Grace played 22, I think. 22. So it's very difficult if you just go on stats. You had to look at how they were judged in their era. And I tried to read a lot about that and find out and the type of surfaces and so forth. And I came down to Jack Hobbs, obviously. He was regarded as the master on good pitches. 
difficult pitches, rain affected pitches. He got a hundred in uh, on a sticky dog in Australia, didn't he? Before lunch in, in Melbourne, was he? Won the match with uh, Sutcliffe, Herbert Sutcliffe from Yorkshire. And uh, so I put Jack Hobbs in and I put WG Grace. I said, well, I only averaged 32 or something and 22 tests. I said, well, it's not his fault. There was only England, Australia playing test matches. And they used to come over once in a flood and play two tests. He just didn't play more. But you look at what he did for the game and how big a figure he was. He made 120 odd hundreds when nobody else was hardly making 50 hundreds, most of them. And he made them on shocking pitches with bricks in them, pebbles and all sorts of things. Oh, they were terrible. They'd no covering. So if it rained the night before, that's what you got. And most of the time, the matches didn't start till lunch or after lunch because they would nothing to dry the pitch out. They had to let it dry out on, it, on its own, hopefully. So I looked at all these things. I went with Hutton. Everybody who played with and against him said his technique was fantastic. I put him at number three. I like three opening batsmen because if you're going to play against other countries with your team, you asked me to pick the best England team. They're going to play against the best Aussies, the best West Indies. Let me tell you, they ain't going to bowl too many spinners. Mm. <laughs> no, no. Spinners can get you out. Fast bowlers can put you in hospital. There are going to be plenty of fast bowlers, right? That's what people are going to bowl. So I had three, three openers. Wally Hammond had to be the doyen. He, well... He rivals Hobbs for the best England batsman of all time. Then I put Compton. I mean, they've all got figures, great figures, but they're other bats as well. But I like, I like one of my players to be a bit inventive, shall we say. Is that a good word? Like Peterson. I don't want three of him. We might be all out for 50 one, one or two days. <laughs> I mean, then he'll, he'll be fantastic on other days. But I like one and Compton could do things. You know, I like that. Obviously, I'd have Ian Botham. He's the best all-rounder England yeah. ever. No, I don't think there's any doubt there. We don't have to discuss that. Alan Knott's the best wicketkeeper we've ever had. Why do I say that? Because I don't base on how many catches and stumpings they got. I base on how many they missed. Because wicketkeepers can only catch a stump what the bowlers provide for them. I mean, Josh Butler, wonderful batsman one day, but... He won't be in my wicketkeeper and he drops too many, makes mistakes. Not he made the fewest of all. Not perfect, none of us are, but he made the fewest. Then you've got to have Sydney Barnes. And a lot of people say, who the hell is he? <laughs> Unless they study cricket, Sydney Francis Barnes. If you work out how many weeks he got in club week cricket, county cricket, test cricket, the average runs they got off him was six runs a wicket. He's phenomenal. Phenomenal. He played more club cricket than minor county cricket, which he played some, than he played very few test, uh, county cricket. I think he played about 70, 80 matches because he got more playing club cricket and minor counties midweek than he got would have got playing county cricket. And you just look at his figures, 170-odd wickets at about 14, 15. I mean, it's ridiculous played four tests on the matting in South Africa when they were good, and he got 40-odd wickets. And he won't play the last test because MCC, he said, had promised to pay for his wife, and they reneged on it, so he wasn't bloody well playing. That's it. <laughs> he was quite a character, cantankerous, so you, you just got to read about him. Uh, Fred Truman, yeah, you, you can't dismiss 300 wickets at 21. 300 wickets at 21, <laughs> the first bowler to get 300 here of what he... Just look at it. And again, strike rate. How I heard many a balls? story... So yeah. I, I, I heard a story about Fred Truman. I've always wanted to know if it's true. Um, he used to... If they were bowling first, he used to stand by the, by, by the gate, waiting for the opening batsman to walk out and then say, I won't close that gate. You won't be out there long enough. And then he well, followed her out there to the middle. It's yeah, crazy. and he said a lot of things like that. He has got to stand at the gate, but he certainly told them, <laughs> you want to play a few shots because I'm going to be bowling next over. If you're still here, I'll knock your <laughs> toe and block off. Oh, yeah, he'd tell him. Let me tell you, he's a proper fast bowler with fiery, fiery Fred. And then I'd pick Harold Larwood. Again, 
the way he bowled, you've got to look at the black and white film. You've got to listen to people on the opposite opposite side who tell you about it. And, whoa, they just never seen anything like him. The pace he bowled, the accuracy, was phenomenal. And if you, he's the only man that could cut Bradman down from 100 to 50. And that's what allowed England to win the Ashes, was him. Jardine worked it out. You cannot beat Australia with Bradman getting 100 average every innings. Because sometimes you've got 200 and nearly 300. Sometimes. You can't beat them to get that many runs. We have to get Bradman out. And he worked out this plan with Haddle Larwood, who was brilliant at it, to bowl it accurately into the ribs. Not at the head, into the ribs. Or here. Very difficult. He's brilliant. And I pick, I want a spinner. Jim Laker, Headley Verity, the best wicket-taking spinners we've had. Really spun the ball accurately. But my worry is always, have you got enough runs for the bowlers to win the match? You must make enough runs. You can have the best bowlers in the world, but if you can't make enough runs, you won't win. So I'm not going for either of those. I went for the Yorkshireman, Wilfred Rhodes, who got 4,000 and some first last wickets, got 30 odd thousand runs. I want to shore up the batting with Botham and him. And his record playing for England is brilliant. He opened the innings 19 times with Jack Hobbs. And Jack Hobbs and Herbert Sutcliffe average 80 odd for their partnership, owning partnership. He is the next best of any of us. Boycott, Gooch, Cook, you name it. Hutton, any of them, is Hobbs and Rhodes. You want to see his figures. And he's great match-winning performance, so I'd have him. That's my 11. Thank you very Hello. much. Very Thank good. You, brilliant, brilliant Thank question you, and, and a great answer. And I think Wilfred Rhodes was the only guy who's batted from 1 to 11. He, he actually batted a number one to 11, 11 to start with, didn't he? For England. For England, oh. they started at 11 and opened yeah. the innings with Jack Hobbs. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, this is... Um, record. He still has a record for an opening partnership, 323, England-Australia at Melbourne. And both of them made 170, 178, 1179. Brilliant. Hey, um, so Jeff, yes, Nort. Nort. So, thanks, Rob, for that brilliant question. And, and well done for, for thinking of it. Very uh, sorry, Nort. Very quickly, yeah. could Sir Geoffrey uh, wish happy birthday to uh, Rob's grandfather, Joe, who's 94, and Geoffrey's his hero. Oh, I remember that. Rob, 94 not out. Let me tell you, once you get in the 90s, it's pretty easy to get hundreds. So don't give it away. Whatever you're drinking, whatever you're eating, keep on doing it. And just tud along to 100, the magical figure. Not many get there, but some are better at it than others. <laughs> Happy birthday. You on? You on? Brilliant. Fantastic. Well done. Great. Um, we've got Amanda next. Now, Amanda is the daughter of the former Yorkshire cha chairman, is it? Is that right? Amanda? Chief executive. Chief executive. You probably know um, Richard Hassel, was it? Chris. Chris, Chris Hassel. Hassel. Sorry. Yeah, I know Chris well. Well, this is Amanda. About so, yeah. two, three mile from us. <laughs> good to see you, I, Amanda, um, anyway. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, really good to, to listen to you, uh, Jeffrey. And and actually, your your top eleven is going to cause huge uh, wave of WhatsApps between our group because they're really active in um, in comparing their sort of their uh, their sort of eleven starting line, and I I suspect there's going to be lots of reactions. This is where I wrote it all. This is where I did my what you just said. And it, Brilliant. I, it was fascinating mm. studying all the Australians, the South Africans, and everything, and just it's only an opinion, but just trying to. Yeah, do the best. And, you, and you've certainly done your research on it as well. So, because yeah. I've read, I've read that book actually. I mean, I did fall asleep a little bit, but it was good. It was, it was interesting. Um, anyway, they said I fall asleep all the time when I'm reading yours. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, that's because um, you don't understand. There's too many long words in it. That's why. Correct. <laughs> Come on, yeah, let's have just, Amanda's question. I'm just going to change <laughs> James' tack slightly. So, um, so I, I know obviously that you're a huge supporter of, of uh, schools cricket and youth yeah. development and and Yorkshire schools cricket in particular. Um, so I was just sort of wondering, given you know the the phenomenal sort of success over over many years of, of Yorkshire providing 
uh, opportunities for kids to show their talent and then going on to play for England. And, um, you know, you'll be able to reel off a whole a whole host of people who came through the, the school system. But more recently, obviously, Vaughan, Fairstow, Root, um, Hoggard, etc. Um, it appears that uh, the English Schools Cricket Association, ESCA, um, and its volunteers have been a bit sidelined in favour of the ECB funded county boards and sort of related, I suppose, to your earlier sort of comments about marketing and the commercialism of it. Yeah. It sort of it seems to me that a lot of the kids, you know, for, for kids to access those ECB um, uh, schools opportunities, you have to have a bit of money or your parents have to be, you know, able to sort of support you. So I just wondered if you've got any any thoughts on how you might improve the development of, of young cricketers. Um, and ensure that those without the financial means do get the opportunities to, to sort of come through the system? I've thought for a long time now that the school system is wrong. We used to have these long seven-week summer holidays so that kids many, many years ago could help farmers get the crops in because we didn't have a lot of machinery long before we were born. And it's not needed now anymore. And I always feel that... With the summers we have and the long evenings, the kids should be at school till maybe five o'clock and finish the school curriculum at three and be out every afternoon playing sport of cricket, tennis, whatever, athletics. It's good for them anyhow. And that would be better for sport in this country. It'd be better for kids to be having, you know, fresh air and exercise. And, and I think that, you know, when we're in on cold dark evenings when it's dark at four that's when they should be swatting and doing exams not swatting for university or exams in the summer months they should be outside and i feel that you know it would benefit all sports cricket yes but other sports as well to be outside in the summer you change the curriculum around and then the english cricket board the ecb with all its money now instead of giving it to the counties they should set up to help schools buy in equipment, helping with ex-players of county players to help with coaching. If there was five nights a week, five afternoons a week, carry on into the evenings if you want, they could be coaching kids as well. And if we didn't have seven weeks holiday, there'd be more cricket, tennis, athletic, football, if you want, everything played outdoors. And they'd be spending money wise. I mean, look, Chance to Shine has been doing what it can. For the last two, 10, 12, how long, Simon? 15 years? At least, I mean, yeah. yeah. I know I've helped because I'm involved a little bit, but I'm not one of the leaders. Mark Nicholas is a friend of mine. but And they go to communities, they go to some schools, they bring in some uh, ex-county players to help coach. But look, they can only do so much because they've got to find money to fund it all. ECB has pots of money. I mean, that all they've got to do is stop having so many batting and bowling coaches and they could pay for everything, couldn't they? There's that bloody many with England. There's so many. I mean, I don't know what they do. I mean, I don't understand that. We, we seem to have that much money from television now and sponsorship. We just waste it. We waste it. I mean, here's a thought for you. When I was playing, the last thing I want, I'm getting ready to bat the day before, is somebody talking to me on coaching me in the net. The last thing I want. You ask people like Jack Nicholas at golf. Mm -mm. He's done all his work before and he doesn't want somebody upsetting his train of thought. With too many coaches with the main team, it's the kids we should be doing. We should be getting clubs. Clubs are dying for help, aren't they? For generating. And you can't get more club players if you don't get more kids playing. Because the kids grow up and then, then they've loved cricket as a youngster. They go on to play club cricket. You've got to catch them at school age more and more, give them more help, more money to schools for everything. That's the way to do it, in my opinion. What do you think, Amanda? Have you got yeah, I think, I, I think that's a great idea. solution. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good idea um, because actually it plays to the sort of government's, you know, sort of... Um, healthy you know let's yes. um obesity um mm. issue and all of that you know if we played encourage people to be more outdoors and playing more sport generally nope. and then all sports would benefit wouldn't they so south africa until they were ostracized and everything so forth uh, because of their apartheid and everything 
they had schooly. Kids went at eight o'clock to school and they finished at two, two thirty, and they were out playing cricket. That's why a lot of ex players like myself, we had no jobs in the winter. The counties only paid us six months, April to September. We went to South Africa coaching. Their kids all got coaching, played games, were out there, better for them. And they turned out some fantastic cricketers because of that. I know about apartheid. I was wrong. I know that. And black people didn't get opportunity. But what they did with the school in there was right. You know, they're getting coaches to coach them, getting time on the sports field every day. They never went home till five o'clock. Busters came at five o'clock to take them home. The mums were happy. They were at school a bit longer. Mums, are, they'd vote for it every time. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Amanda. Simon? Yeah, Seb's with us. Uh, I think this is going to be our last question. Um, I've got one more after this, actually. I'll be one more after this. Okay, right. Okay, Seb, go fire away. Hi, Sir Jeffrey. It's a great honour to hear you speak. Thanks for joining us. Um, you've spoken a lot about your sort of mental strength and you were very well known for your temperament, not giving your wicket away. Um, <laughs> And you've also brought up that as one of the problems with England's sort of top order batting in quite a few years now. Watching the top order fail in India, <coughs> excuse me, um, made me think of Haseeb Hamid, mm. who was nicknamed the baby boycott in 2016 and looked ready made to be a star at test level. Um, he's since completely disappeared. I was just wondering where whether you sort of, where you see him going now, what you think the reasons are for his demise and also you know we there's a lot of coaching surrounding technique and things but did you find that your mental strength also needed regular training to stay as strong as it always was no i was born with it i can play golf occasionally when i do and you know our golfers are oh, finicky about anybody moving or making a sound when they hit him you can do anything you want when i'm playing it doesn't make any difference I sort of, it's there, I register, but it doesn't affect me. Oh, it's a gift. I'm sure it is that. And to know that, uh, that young man, I met him in India, because that's where he, he went, didn't he, to India with England. I met him there. They brought him to meet me and say hello. I, no. So I don't know much about him, but I listen to people. And there are about, there's one major thing I will say about youngsters. I'm very keen, and I've done coaching in my time, watch players. When you watch a guy play in the nets, you can see fairly quickly, or I can, whether he's got any particularly good talent. I can see that. I can watch his knee, I watch his feet, how he moves. Is it in sync, in rhythm? I watch all that. The one thing you can't see is inside here, the heart, and in the head. You can't see what goes on. You can only tell how good he's going to be at mental strength, toughness in difficult situations, how he's going to handle a bowler who's giving him difficulty. You can only see that in a match. And this is where I think people sometimes fail. They see somebody in the net playing lots of shots, wonderful, whoa, 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 hang on. The great bowlers aren't going to give you lots of balls to play lots of shots. No, 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 they don't do that. <laughs> they ain't going to give it to you. And so until you see them in the in a match situation. And I think people maybe went overboard too quickly to the boy. See, I don't know him. I've met him once, but I don't know him. That's the difference. Else I could tell you a bit more, but I just don't know the lad. Um, I did hear whispers, true or false, I don't know, that he wasn't so clever against the short ball. Mm, if that's true, that's dodgy. To play test match cricket, are there any quicks around, they're definitely going to see you. If you handle a short ball or two poorly, you're going to get more. So you better learn to handle it quickly. Um, I know he had a fairly overbearing father. I've never thought that's a good idea. I know fathers want their sons to do well. They want to encourage them, spend a bit of money, help them. But they should back off. They, they, it's not a good thing to be on top of your son all the time. I've seen it. I'm not going to mention people, but I've seen it. It doesn't help. So therefore, I think I don't know any more than that. I'm sad about the lad. I used to look for his name. I thought, 
what the heck's happened to him? Why is he making runs? He can't. I've seen him on television. He looked fine. So I don't know. I really don't know any more than that. I don't know if that helps, but I don't know. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyway, thanks for the question, Seb. Um, we've got one more new uh, member, uh, Richard Harris, I think. Is that right? Um, have you got him north somewhere? Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi Richard. Hi, uh, yeah. It's, uh, Good well, to see you. Everyone, it's a genuine pleasure to listen to you, Sir Jeffrey, and to talk to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm, uh, I'm Kentish, actually, born and bred, so I'm very happy to hear Alan not uh, getting a, a good mention, although mm -hmm. slightly disappointed that Derek Underwood didn't make your your, your spinner, but uh, I can't get past Wilf Rhodes, I, I guess. He can't bat. I love him, <laughs> but he can't bat. I can bowl Derek out. <laughs> yeah, true, true enough. There's a, um, just one thing quickly about the sixes, the, the Compton uh, thing about only having three sixes. My dad told me that... Um, his dad used to bolt him in the garden, and if the ball went over the cabbage patch, I above the height of the cabbages, he was out. Yeah, yeah. That was the that was the sort of training for for Dennis Compton. That, that was the whole thing about to, to avoid hitting. It. That was that was his technique for that. Well, one. I played. I uh, lived in a terrace house, mining house. My father was a miner, and you saw in Coronation Street the rows of houses. So you've got like a ginnel, haven't you? And we played cricket there with the, um, what do you call the manhole cover? Was the wickets? We didn't have any wickets. So we always argued whether he just hit the stumps or just missed them. But so we had to hit it straight or square on the offside, square on the leg. And if we hit it up in the air, it went into Mrs. So and so's garden. He had to go get it quick before she confiscated or the bloody dog bit him. You know, you got to jump over the gate and get it fast. <laughs> Also, the game's finished. Simple. So you better hit it on the floor. And if you hit it in the garden, it's definitely out because it could finish the game. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of them had dogs and it's going to bite you, you know, <laughs> so you better be quick. <laughs> so, yeah, all these things are, well, they're training for you when you're growing up. And anything, look, everything we do at cricket, like soccer, rugby, Whatever it is, it's, you're training yourself to play, aren't you? Mm. That's all you're doing when you practice. You're training yourself. So if you have to, how to, your parents have said you've got to do this or that, and you do it, that's how you play. Mm. Like the kids have said growing up today, it's 2020. I didn't tell you, I met uh, Raul Dravid, who I know well, brilliant player. And, and he was at a, many years ago at a MCC uh, World of Cricket when I was on the committee, I sat next to him and he'd just come for his first meeting. And we're talking about his two boys. I said, how, how are they doing, you know? He, oh, he said, Jeffrey. He said, they think I can't play. I couldn't play. I said, what? He, he's like, he's technique, he's a brilliant player, wasn't he? I said, you kidding? No, no, he said. He said, the, how many sixes did you hit that? Well, he's like me, he didn't hit many sixes. He said, well, did you hit many fours? That's all they want to know. And he was telling me, he says, they go and practice with the mates and he stands there with the bat in the air on his sons and the other one stands about 15 yards away and throws the ball and he tries to whack it for six every time, which is what I always said when it first happened in 2020. It's cricket's answer to baseball. When you think about it, they stood there trying to hit sixes on their fours. That's what it is. That's not a criticism. It's what it is. It's cricket's formation of baseball and his kids don't think he could play and he was a brilliant player not good brilliant player i found it fascinating and that's how kids grow up now we grow up like comp didn't keep it on the floor so that's what we do the game that, we um, play there was leads, no 2020 that leads nicely into your question richard actually doesn't it you didn't mute. get that rich what was that i didn't get that was mute. I think he's on mute somehow. Well, the sound on Rich. <laughs> I've got muted again for some reason. I didn't touch the computer. I'm not sure what happened there. But anyway, yeah, I was going to talk about the um, the hundred and what you thought about it. Although Simon, Man, we did mention that earlier on. Um, if I could sort of slightly extend on that, um, the hundred obviously is going to see some pretty inventive kind of batting shots. You know, the sort of stuff that has 
um, happened in the T20 game. What's your opinion of of the sort of new styles of batting in the sense that, you know, the history of the game has had loads of people who have sort of invented a new way of playing, of batting, right back 250 years ago to John Small with his straight bat, or Silver Billy Belden with, you know, advancing to meet the ball or whatever. Um, then you've got your switch hits from KP 10 years ago, whatever, hitting it for six, which I know I heard, I remember you on commentary, but that was an amazing, thought that was an amazing shot. What do you feel about the development of batting shots? Is anything allowed? Is it all, is it all okay? Um, and also the bracket question is, what do you think of the hundred? Although I think I'm in the corridor of certainty there. So, uh. <laughs> um, Look, 2020, I said earlier, is, is entertainment. It's not supposed to be like test cricket, a real examination of your technique, uh, your mental strength, your courage with fast bowlers. It, it, it's not that. It's supposed to be fun entertainment. That's what it was produced for. You know, for a market to get people um, in India in the evenings watching away from soap operas and things like that because they love cricket. And, it, and it's, it's done exactly that. And countries like the Big Bash in Australia and then other countries have followed on with their England are finally going to do something. Sometimes, though, when you come in late, it's too late. You want to be up at the beginning of everything. That's that's why they've caught the market of India. A great idea. A wonderful idea. Um, I was asked to go to the first one. And for, unfortunately, I was in South Africa writing and completing a book. So I, I couldn't go, which I always found sad. I'm real sad, disappointed. But I knew I had to do so many words by a certain date. Um, yeah. I think... Any shot is all right. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Try something different. If it works, use it. And that's what they've done. They've looked at the game like the bowlers. A lot more now on certain pitches, they're not bowling length. They're bowling halfway down the pitch. So the ball comes up at different heights, different pace. They're making it difficult. The ball's up here. Not up there, because then it's a Y. But if it's up here and you... you there's very few shots you can play up here. So they've worked it out for themselves of the bowlers, haven't they? Plunkett was brilliant at it. In the middle of the innings, they haven't found anybody like Plunkett. Since they've retired him, they haven't found anybody as good with England. Mm. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game that's innovative. Is that the right word? And mm. people are going to go on finding new innovations. Mm. And, and I think that's, that's great. What's wrong with that? Mm. Won't work in test cricket, but it's not test cricket. Yeah, I, in terms of the hundred, I, I do wonder if they're just becoming too gimmicky. Mm. You know, I mean, what's it, what's it matter what we call it when somebody's out or a wicket? Does it really matter? Is it that? Do you think people are going to go or not go because of that? Do you think that's going to encourage more people to go? I think some of the marketing men are idiots. As I said to you before, I don't think they have a soul for cricket. Mm. They're just money makers. There's nothing wrong with the game. I mean, they haven't changed calling it wickets or outs in the IPL in India, and it goes from strength to strength, doesn't it, Simon? Mm. It goes from yeah. strength to strength. Yeah, more and They're more. Still wickets, and still the stone, and everything. Yeah. yeah. Still the pitch. We still have one ball. You know, I mean, the ball's the same size, shape. Um, they haven't. People who watch it in India, they like Test cricket, they like 50 over cricket, they like 2020. They love cricket. Mm. And I think there's a danger. I saw Michael Vaughan saying, I think he's right, that many of the people that watch Test cricket, quite a lot of them are still going to go to 2020, to the 100 league or whatever you want to call it, uh, because they love cricket. Yes, some won't, but a lot will. And changing. Names, how the hell does that work? How the hell does that make it better? It's barmy. <laughs> but, but they are barmy people. They, they feel they have to do something because they paid a lot of big consultancy money, just wasted money by the ECB. Mm -hmm. That's some players. We're going to ask some ex-players who play, who, who really don't want you to pay them. People like me will give you ideas, give you views, because we love the game. We don't want you to pay us for it, like these big consultancy firms. There's plenty of players around who love it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent answer. Excellent question.
Thank you, Richard, and I hope you enjoyed tonight and uh, we, we, you know, continue to, to support it. Um, Norts, we've got another happy birthday thing, haven't we? Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, a member, Malcolm Lowry, whose birthday is today. I Malcolm that... Lowry. Is, is it your birthday today, Malcolm? Well, I don't know where he is. Yeah, he's waving. Um, so, Jeffrey, could you wish let Malcolm... How old is he? We need to know how old you are. Hold on. What to eat? What? What to eat? 48. 48. 48. He's, he's mm. saying it in a Glaswegian accent. Mm. Oh, it was it was a foreign accent. I know that. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I can't understand. <laughs> 48? 48 not out. You haven't got your 50 yet. Oh, blimey. Happy birthday, Bert. You've a long way to go. Those two runs should be very easy, let me tell you. 48, piece of cake, into 50. But you've a long way to go to get to the magic figure of 100. And let me tell you, if you get anywhere near it, even into the 80s, I won't be here to wish you well even, even then. <laughs> I'll have gone long ago. <laughs> so Thank God for that. Have a nice day. <laughs> Excellent. the oldest man in Glasgow at that. <laughs> oh, are you a Rangers supporter or Celtic? Stran Ra. Oh. Stranraa. Can they play football? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can they play? No. <laughs> Still no, going to no. support them, though. Still going to support them. It's got to be Rangers them. or Celtic, man. Anyway, listen, uh, excellent. <laughs> well, done. well, happy birthday, Malcolm. I hope we've, we've made your evening uh, with that. Um, sorry to slag off Stranra like that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, right. One more thing. One more thing, Simon. One more thing. Yes, quick. One more thing from me. Quiz question. Yes. Quiz question. Yeah, we'll do that at the end. Um, so uh, before before that, we have a quiz for you, Jeffrey. Okay. Listen, it'll be half time soon if you don't hurry up. Yeah, right. We're going to hurry up. Okay. So this is a quiz called How Well Do You Know Yourself? Right. Oh, it, starts, well. it starts with some music. Okay. Right. There's no conferring or phoning a friend or anything. This is no. the leaderboard here um so far this uh, this sort of term if you like i don't know if you can see that um so your mate mr gower yeah nine he's out good 10 nine points he's out good. of 10 he got chris woke he's six good. points so you, you you you're only the third contestant in this term of, of the quiz, <laughs> Thanks. okay so uh, not too much uh, pressure here uh and it's 10 questions and if you get the answer right you get this he's got and if you get it wrong, you get this. Okay? I get that. So Simon and I are going to ask you the questions and you have to come up with the answers, right? Yeah. So, 10 questions. Uh, we want the answers in, you know, 10 seconds, hopefully. Simon, do you want to fire away? Yeah, I'll start with question number one. You get a little bit of time to think about it. But, um, yeah, so Alistair Cook got four and Andrew Strauss and David Gow nine. They're the most so far in our in our, our winter of, of quizzing. Right, qu Question number one, we've talked about your 100th, 100 at Headingley. You made 191. How many fours did you hit? Was it? I'm the clue. I'm the clue. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll give you, I'll give you a little... Was it one? No. It, was it five? Was it 17? Was it 23, 27 or 30? So you made 191. What was after 17? 23. Mm. 23. He's got it! Very is good. The, is the right answer. Good guesswork. One out of one. Excellent. Right. Question two. How many times were you run out in test cricket? Whoa. Christ. And we'll give you, if you get within one of this, we'll give you it. Mm. Well, I had about 170 innings. 170, 180 innings. 193, actually, I think it was. Did I? Right, yeah. I, uh, I did know this. 
So not how many times you ran someone else out, Jeffy. That was that was like that um, was very few. In calculating, <laughs> cal- there, there aren't enough digits in the in in the sort of English numerals to get that not right. Not my but... fault if they didn't run fast enough, <laughs> no, is it? No, no, no. How many times were you run out in Test cricket? So we'll give you one either way. It's it's in single figures. It's less than ten. Mm. Yeah, I I'm just trying to think of going to go through them all. He's trying to. He's got. He's trying to work it out. <laughs> no, he's He'll be here I, all night. I told you. He no, could have no. I could tell oh, you I every innings he played. I told you yours. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> he's got it. I don't know how you knew that. You were just bullshitting us there, weren't you? You knew it all along. <laughs> <laughs> two out of two. <laughs> right here we go then. Now, Jeffrey, we've talked about your. Um, we talked about a little bit about your batting. Your bowling. You dismissed seven batsmen in Test cricket. Um, goodness knows how you managed that. Okay, seven batsmen in Test cricket. How yeah. many? How many were left-handers? <clears throat> Two. Is the right answer, and you probably know who they were. Can you? Yeah, you tell me? Graham yeah. Follick and Tom Beavers. I got yeah. him stumped. Yeah, absolutely right. So three out of three. Three out of three. Yours? You should have seen that ball to Graham Pollock. It was a beauty. Oh, God. No, we don't want to hear that. Right. Yeah. Question four. On which English ground did you have your lowest and highest test match averages? On which test ground did you have your lowest and highest test match te- averages? That, One of each. Te- test grounds, that is, yeah. So yes. it's not, yeah. So only the England ones. Hmm. Lowest and highest. Oh, Oval must have been highest. I got a few hundreds there. Lowest? Hmm. Uh, lowest. Wow. Edge busting. You sure? Not sure. I'm just. <clears throat> Overall. Mm. Highest Headingley, 59.8. Lowest Old Trafford, 36.8. Mm. Mm. Nope. I thought you would have said Headingley. Yeah. So Average did I. 60 there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got to double, I got a 190 on, but I also, Sobers did me a couple of times there. Oh, I did get 100 against uh, Pakistan there, but yeah, just... All right. Well, anyway, that's three out of four. Okay. Question five. Which two bowlers dismissed you most in Test cricket? Oh, well, Lily and Sobers. He's got it! Very good. Do you know how many times? So it would be about four, I think, I'm guessing. Did me once as a spinner, three times as a seamer. It's actually a few more than that. Anyway, it's seven, in fact. Anyway, that's good. You got the answer right. Correct. Four out of five. Question six. Who were the first and last bowlers to dismiss you in Test cricket? The first bowler to dismiss me was Graham Calling at Nottingham, caught Simpson at Slip. Brilliant catch. Um, and the last one was Madden Lal, Calcutta. He's got it! Very, very good indeed. Do you know how many you made in those two innings? 48. The first one, six in the last one. He's LBW. got it! Awesome. You, you, do, you don't get out enough, do you? You really don't. <laughs> Five out of six. I should say, when we were putting this quiz together, I sent yours the questions that I'd done, about six six or seven of them. He said, these are too difficult. You'll never get these. And I said, you, look, yours, he, he knows everything about his own career, just about. He'll, he'll knock them off no trouble at all. He'll knock them off like that half volley from Greg Chappell at Headingley. Right, OK, here we go. Uh, question seven. Who made more test match ducks 
This is on a 50-50. You or Alistair Cook? Oh, right. This is... I, know, I know how many I made. I made 10. I know you can know those that got me out. <laughs> On what ground? I told I you. Probably, I can probably, probably tell you the of, year. Probably the time of day and what <laughs> colour socks they were wearing and everything. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. I think that's worth half a point, isn't it? No, I'll give you half a point for that. Yeah. So did Cook make less or more noughts than you? That's a good question, but he played 50 tests more than me. So you would think he made more noughts than me because he, he made... He had 50 more test match innings. 50 more, yeah, which is could be 70 innings, couldn't he? 80 innings. But wasn't there a it, long time when he didn't get a duck at all? He didn't, wasn't he have, didn't he hold that record for not having any ducks at all? And also he played on he didn't play on uncovered pitches. No, no, he didn't. Uh, it's it's yeah, it's, it's I mean. Right, more or less. I think he'd make more than me. No, did he? Well done. Mm. Well done. Yeah, he made one fewer. He made nine, and as you said, you made ten. So you get half a point for that. So where are we now, Yoss? We've good. got that's that's uh, six five, and a half out of eight. He um, did good. Five yeah. and a half out of seven, I make it. Five no. and a half. Yeah, five and a half oh, out of seven. Oh, sorry, because that was the seventh question. Yeah. Right here we go, Yoss. Your, your question. Okay, question eight. On which county ground, which is also a one-day international venue? Did you average over 100 in first-class cricket in all your career? There was one ground which you averaged over 100, played a, a lot of times there. It's, a, it's also a one-day international venue. It's a home ground of a county. You averaged over 100 in your career in first-class cricket. Wow. It has one-day internationals. Jesus. That's a bit of a clue, actually. Are you saying only one day internationals, yours? Well, I didn't say test cricket. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. I'm trying to think where I played. I didn't play any one day there. So this is your first class average at this ground, over right. 100. And it's right. a ground which is a, is a home base for a county. And they also stayed one-day internationals. But you didn't play a one-day international. No, I didn't. No, no I don't remember no. doing that. No. Mm. Um, Colchester, I always over 100. No, but you did. You didn't, and also it doesn't stay. I did. I got. I got two double unders there. <laughs> Big ones and one. All right, well, anyway, anyway, <laughs> I only um, played two innings in my life. This there. is a county headquarters, <laughs> but it also stages one day internationals. But Colchester doesn't stage one day internationals, right. and it's not well, a county headquarters this. either. Right. It's not that mm. odd. There's only three grounds it could be really. You've been there. It's got a commentary box at a funny angle. It did have. Yeah. Right. I don't really know. Uh, Think of Simon Mann. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, um, Where's he from? Where's Simon Mann? Come on, we're trying to help you here. Where's Simon you are, Mann I from? Know. I have no idea. Where I am is a bloody hundred. Christ. No. Get Rachel to tell you then. I don't know. Where well, is it just right? have a guess. Have a guess. It's a, a county ground in the sort of you know in the south somewhere, which stages one day internationals. Have a guess. Mm. It's going to be Hove, Taunton, Bristol, or Canterbury. Which one is it? I would say Bristol. Finally, we He's got, got there. You got it. Correct. You average over a hundred at Bristol. Been quite a lot of innings. Well done. Six and, yeah, half out of Six and a half out of eight. Two questions to go. Right, this is a Yoz question. Question number nine. How many books have you written? Oh, is it, my God. Is it nine, 12, or 15? Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> are you going on coaching books as well? And everything? Yeah, yeah. I've, read, I've got a list of them.
course, I've done a quiz book as well. So 9, 12, or 15. Oh. Go on. 12. He's got it! Correct! <laughs> 12 books. Seven and a half out of nine. Final question, Yoz. Final question. Round the house, this is a domestic question. <laughs> what bad habit was Rachel always nagging you about, which you have slowly eradicated? Huh? Something, to do with the me. Something to do with the kitchen. What bad habit has she, you know, sort of more or less stopped nagging you about because you've kind of cured it? Uh, this question. Well, she always wanted me to wash it up, but she always wanted me to do the dishwasher. I do them all now. I'm a bloody butler and I'm all sorts. <laughs> so if you, if you had to pick one thing then, yeah. Presumably uh, this came from it. Rachel, did it? This came from Rachel, this question, yours, did it? <laughs> I'm bloody good at it now, let me tell you. I take a tea on the morning, I take a crumpet, I fill the dishwasher, I wash up. What well, absolutely brilliant I am. He's got it! I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you. I'm a brilliant point for that. at it now. I'll, I'll give you a point. The actual to answer be honest, was I'm not very good at OLs. Well, the actual answer was she said that you often used to leave the dishes soaking in the sink rather than washing them up. Well, but I just you... let them soak and then I wash them. Yeah, and then she's got fed, get she gets fed up because they're they yeah, finds all these dishes with cold water in them in the morning. She can't leave them. She, she tends to just leaving them for me. She can't. So now I, I have to do it. But anyway, we'll give you a point for that. And well done for in, improving your domestic habits. And for that, <laughs> you have got eight and a half out of ten. <laughs> you in second place, just behind Mr. D.I. Gower. Excellent. Yes. Well done. Final Goodbye. thing you have to do now is um, we're going to give this away. This is the Cricketer cover uh, from yes. last, um, mm. October when you were 80. We featured you, obviously. You I'm did. going to get you to Very sign good. this. Um, yes. And a lucky uh, uh, member is going to win this signed copy of the Cricketer magazine front cover. You have a question. or Do you have the question? or? Uh, oh, I think not? I do. I think I do have a question. So you don't have the question. Well, I'll tell you what, we, we will ask the question. Uh, people get ready on your chat box for answering mm. it. Um, and this is uh, this is also to win the headphones as well that uh, that um, uh, Alex has kindly given up. Right. So it's winning the headphones and also this signed picture of the, of the front cover. OK. And the question is, your favourite um, artiste is Katy Perry. Yes. Correct. Correct. OK. What we want to know from the audience, uh, so get ready on the chat box, is what year was she born? What year was Katy Perry born? First one to get it wins the prizes. Norts, Simon. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking got, up. I'm looking through. There's 1978 lots. 1978 here. There's lots of uh, answers. We need to. We need to. We need to see the first person. Uh, we have to wait. Just wait for everyone to have a go first. Lots of people are having a go. So they're still coming in now. So just wait. And while, while, we're, while people are answering, and we'll get the first person who's got the right answer, and we'll give them the prize. Um, we we'll, have we'll... got an answer, by the way, which is correct now. So okay. Well, you we'll can stop, and I will announce that in a second. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. well, just one very quick thing from Pushka, who says, just at Colchester, Jeffrey averaged 493. Yeah, I told you. The garrison ground at Colchester. Yeah. I like cool. there. 493. Anyway, right. Okay, we're Mickey gonna... Mouse boundaries or something. <laughs> no, I keep... they had some good players. John, I Lee, reckon they, they they must have rigged the scoreboard. They had a, that that was the Essex scoreboard on wheels, which they wheeled round yeah, the different grounds. I reckon yeah. you paid the score operator to sort of put it up higher numbers or something. The Garrison Ground at Colchester, and the third year after it got two double hundreds, one of them not out. I was down to play again there. And I was cheering. And uh, Taylor went in, the captain, and told her we're not playing at Colchester. We've seen enough of that B boycott. And they moved it to Chelmsford. And Fletcher tells the story. They all got ready to get me out, and he got Keith Boyce to bounce me. Bounce me. First four balls. I hooked. I got a glove on it. 
and Tonka Taylor dropped it and I got 140. <laughs> <laughs> Fledge says, well, we just couldn't believe it, you know. Yeah, because we were both playing test cricket together at that time. And uh, so he told us afterwards, <laughs> we just laughed. I told you remembers everything else. I know it's unbelievable. Oh, your memory is unbelievable. <clears throat> you know, I can't. I can't. You know, anyway, listen, right. So, just, what's the answer? Just, well, what, what? the answer is. Do you know the answer, Boyd? Yeah, no. 1984. 1984. Correct. Right. Well, the person who got Chinese the first... right. Yes. Yeah. Because the... of course you're experts on these birth yeah. years, aren't She's you? She's warm-hearted. Warm-hearted. Nice less. Right. The, first, the person with the first 1984 in the chat box is Paul Williams. So well done, Paul. Actually, it was, really? the sec was actually the second answer that came in. Let's see if anyone else got 19. Yeah, yeah Seth Evans. Amanda, Seth Evans, Amanda got yeah. it as well. Tim yeah. Knight. Yeah, lots of people went for 1984. But Paul was the first. So well, that's, um, that's what we go well, with. I wonder where Paul lives because um, it's going to test Alex for... De delivering the fruit. Anyway, um, we'll probably give us. We'll, we'll give a Hartford. consolation prize. Somebody Hartford. who's somebody Hartford. who lives a bit. Okay, Hartford. Well, I might get. We might get a London winner to get the uh, the prize of the fruit. Actually, because Alex can't really Alex, drive Alex, to Hartford. Uh, it's not. See, Alex isn't giving the fruit as a prize. He's having oh, it himself. He's it? eating it himself. Right. Yeah. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> we haven't mentioned rhubarb, have we? Anyway, um, it's too, you know, the night is, 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 is gone now, so we're, we're done. Um, mm. Just um, one final thing I was going to say. What was I going to say? Damn, I've completely forgotten it. Um, oh, that's annoying. Wait. Um, oh, yeah. Tilt, tilt your camera a tiny bit to your left shoulder. I just want to see what's behind your left shoulder. Isn't that the picture there? the other way? Oh, which is, where's the picture of you on the wall? Other That's way. in the kitchen. That's in the kitchen, y'all. I thought That's you were kitchen. in the kitchen. No, no we're in the, the dining room. So what's that picture on your left shoulder there, then? To the left. Shoulder? The what other side. That? Yeah, that side. It's William Russell Flint. Oh. Rachel loves them. There's quite a few uh, watercolour. Oh, right. William Russell okay. Flint. Right. We can't see all your memorabilia. That's fine. Anyway, listen. Well, they can show it, yeah? No, no, don't, don't worry. I think people have got beds to go to now. <laughs> They want to go watch the football. Yeah, yes. good, yeah, yeah. Got to watch the football. Exactly. So good, good point. Good point. Um, thank Jeffrey. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been really enjoyable. We all miss you, of course, and uh, we'll get you back on again when you get bored. Um, Simon. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. Well done in the quiz. Eight and a half out of ten. Uh, that's one of our strongest scores in the whole winter. And I, David I, Gower's I, already done, you know. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> you only had three. Simon, both Simons. Nice to see you. Cheers. It's, Take care. it's been great. So, and, and, and many thanks to Rachel as well. Yeah. Great to see you both yeah. and have a good night. Thank you, everybody else as well. Say hello to your Nancy. Yeah, I will. She's She passes her best to you. I and we'll see Nancy. you soon. She's lovely. Ta da. See you. Thanks Cheers. a lot. Bye bye. Good night. <laughs>